Our subject this morning from God's word is how to be content in all circumstances. Most weeks, if we're honest, you and I live like we have 10,000 reasons to complain. God's word says that if we're in Christ, we have at least 10,000 reasons every week to praise, to be content, to be thankful, to be rejoicing, and really nothing to complain about. Our subject this morning is how to be content in all circumstances. And when it comes to contentment, like a lot of things in life, you will never get the right answer if you're adding up the wrong numbers. You can add them up perfectly, but if you input the wrong numbers into the equation, you'll never get the right answer. The only way to get the right answer is to change the equation so that you're actually adding up the right numbers. When it comes to contentment, we need to change the equation. Because the numbers that we add up, the numbers that I add up when I think about it, that you add up when you think about it every week, our equation goes like this. God plus enough money equals contentment. God plus enough health equals contentment. God plus an answer to these specific prayers equals contentment. Basically, God plus all is well equals contentment. But what I want to show you out of the Bible, specifically in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and in Philippians chapter 4, is that this is the equation. God plus contentment equals wealth. God plus contentment equals health. God plus contentment equals all is well. We'll see this in two places. First, briefly in 2 Corinthians 12, then we'll spend most of our time in Philippians 4. 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 7, Paul's talking about the thorn that he was discontent about and the grace that gave him contentment. Verse 7, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, That's the hinge word for us in verse 9. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 8 is basically where we all get stuck and we get the equation wrong. In verse 8, Paul was saying, God, if you will answer my prayer and take this thorn away, then I'll be fine. And this is where we all get stuck. We, re- we draw our equation wrongly so we never get the right data on the other side of the equals sign. God, if you'll remove these thorns and answer these prayers, then I'll be content. But the thing was, the reason I love this passage is because Paul didn't get those answers that he asked for in verse 8. He said, God, please take this thorn away. And God didn't take the thorn away, but he still came out the other side with contempt. You see, Paul learned that Christ plus contentment equals all is well. We really need to key in on everything after the therefore in verse 9. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I see the word gladly. I see the word content. I am content. And I see the word strong. I'm strong. If we key in on everything after the therefore, we see a seismic shift 
Before the therefore in verse 8, Paul says, oh God, please take this away. God responds, no, I'm not taking it away. In fact, it needs to stay. And then after the therefore, look, full disclosure. If you and I wrote verse 9, it would sound like, fine, God, fine. Don't take it away, fine. All right, whatever. I don't know what the Greek word for it is, but we would say, sheesh, give me a break already. That's how it would go if we wrote it. But so much better than a sullen submission or a biting and kicking acquiescence, Paul moves from acceptance to overcoming to receiving with rejoicing, receiving a no answer with rejoicing and saying, I am content. I want you to see it. It's just two little verses, but there is an absolute sea change from before the therefore to after the therefore in this passage, an absolute sea change. He says, I, I, instead of complaining about my situation, instead of being discontent about my situation, I glory in it, I rejoice in it. Instead of, I'll live under it, but I'm not content and everybody around me is gonna know that I feel ripped off by God in my life. Way too many Christians walk around that way. I walk around that way too much, we all do. Everyone's gonna know that God didn't give me what I wanted. And I I need their sympathy. Instead of that, Paul says, I'm I'm not just going to endure them. I'm going to sing. And my soul is going to be lifted up even in the middle of suffering. He moves from complaining to conquering. He moves from wanting to be rid of it to being all right with it. And his discovery is this, that the grace of Jesus Christ makes a cross, which is something so despised without the grace of Christ. But the grace of Christ makes a cross, which is something so despised into something of value. The grace of Christ makes a thorn, which is something to be hated without the grace of Christ, into something of beauty. It's this discovery. What changed the equation? What was it that made all the difference? Well, what comes before the therefore that provides the seismic shift in our passage? Verse nine, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. He heard Christ say, my grace is sufficient for you. So contentment in Paul's life, contentment in your life, If you'll listen to the word of God this morning, it doesn't have to be a feeling. Contentment in your life can be a fact that is grounded on something as solid as the person and work of Jesus Christ. Contentment can be something as solid as that which is grounded in the person and work of Christ. Question. What is more solid than the person and work of Jesus Christ? Your temporary circumstances that make you so discontent? I didn't think so. It has to be rooted and grounded in Christ. Christ's life, Christ's bloody death, Christ's triumphant resurrection. When those dead eyelids snapped open and he walked out of the grave. Even Christ's present ministry of interceding for us and praying for us. This is where it's at. We'll see this in 2 Corinthians 12. Now turn with me back to Philippians 4. We see the word I am content or the phrase I am content in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10. We see the phrase, my grace is sufficient for you, a direct communication from Christ in verse 9. And we'll link this to a couple of phrases that we find in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. 
In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The phrase through him or through Christ in Philippians 4.13 is equal to the phrase in 2 Corinthians 12.9, Christ saying, my grace is sufficient for you. Through Christ, Philippians 4.13, my grace is sufficient, 2 Corinthians 12.9. This is the key link. It's through Christ that we, that we have this state of contentment. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I grew up in North Hollywood, lots of chances to see actors and um, athletes. And when I was in high school, I had um, a pretty good list of, of autographs from athletes and actors. And the ones who were Christian, more than one or two or three of them, they signed, you know, their name. And then they put Philippians 4.13, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Generally, what that means is I have this Super Bowl ring because Christ strengthened me to get it. I won the World Series because Christ strengthened me to do it. The all things of Philippians 4.13, I guess it includes the good things because he actually says there um, uh, plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So I guess... It's okay to say, well, because I had success, it was Christ that strengthened me to have that success. But to me, the leading edge of this often quoted verse is the flip side where he says, I know how to be content in want and in loss and in failure. Philippians 4.13 isn't about like just giving a, a shout out to the man upstairs when we win. Philippians 4.13 is about where do we go when we hit the lowest of lows? Where do we go when contentment in our circumstances is impossible? And I'm not giving you this message this morning up here believing that contentment about your circumstances is easy. Many of you are in more difficult circumstances than I myself have ever faced. Where do we go? when our circumstances make contentment seemingly impossible. That's what this verse is about. I've learned to be content in the time of deepest need, he says. Three observations out of Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Three observations. The first observation is um, about the word whatever in verse 11. Whatever situation or it's about the phrase in verse 12, any and every circumstance. See verse 12, any and every circumstance. Or in verse 13, it's about the phrase all things. That's our first observation. It's about the all things, any and every circumstance, whatever. That's, we'll make our first observation there. Our second observation will be about the word learned in verse 11, I have learned. And again in verse 12, I have learned. That'll be our second observation. And our third observation will be about the word secret in verse 13. He says, I have learned, or verse 12, I should say, I've learned the secret. So first observation is about the phrase, whatever situation, verse 12, about the phrase, any and every circumstance, verse 13, about the phrase, all things. What is our observation about these three phrases? Is that what, we're, what I'm talking about to you right now about contentment Basically, this is it. Your situation is not an exception. No matter what, your situation is not an exception. This is not limited. Your situation did not just, just happen momentarily to ping you outside of the parameters of this promise. Your situation is not an exception. This is for you. This is for you. If I asked you this morning before you came in and before you saw the sermon title and the text, uh, are you content? If you had to give yourself an A, B, C, D, or F on contentment, what would you give yourself? At least when I was in school, they gave you A through F. 
I don't know if they even let kids fail anymore, but that's the subject of a different sermon. If you had to give yourself an A through F on contentment, what would you give yourself? Here's what I'm getting at. I don't care <laughs> what the answer to that question is. There's a more important question than that question. More important than what you would say if you were getting an A or an F in contentment is this. Where would you look for the answer to that question? Where would you look for the answer to that question? Would you look for your, at your mood? Would you look at your circumstances? The great Wayne Gretzky. I never skate to where the puck is. I always skate to where the puck is going to be. If I asked you about your contentment, would you merely skate to where the puck is? It's not the way to answer the question. Or would you skate to where it's going to be? See, if I asked you, how's your contentment, and you immediately kind of looked at your circumstances, well, my job is pretty good, my church is pretty good, but my, but my family is having problems right now. Or if you're like, well, my family's actually pretty good right now, but work is a pain right now. If you begin to look at your circumstances to come up with the grade for yourself, A, B, C, D, or F, you're answering the question the wrong way. You're just going to where the puck is, and that's not gonna, that's not gonna get you anywhere. If your answer is, well, I'm sometimes content, but it depends on the circumstances at the time. That's just skating to where the puck used to be. We tend to think, well, I'm, I'm pretty content, you know, uh, I'm pretty content under the circumstances. What Philippians 4 is saying and what 2 Corinthians 12 is saying is this. If you are, if you are in Christ, you are not under the circumstances. If you are in Christ, if you are in Christ, then you're so not under the circumstances that your contentment is not merely where the puck is, but it's what God has done inside of you so that you can end up saying, Philippians 4, not that I'm speaking in need, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And Philippians 4 verse 12, I know how to be brought low and how to abound in any and every circumstance. And Philippians 4 13, all things. What was the circumstance when Paul was writing this verse? He was either in a prison at worst or on house arrest, if this was after the third missionary journey, at best. But either way, he was locked down. So his equation is not God plus all is well in my circumstances equals contentment. His equation was God plus contentment means all is well and I can do this. I'm not under it. That's our first observation, just that phrase, whatever situation. Our second observation is about the verb, I have learned. That verb shows up both in verse 11 and in verse 12. I have learned, I have learned to be content. It's funny that Paul says this about himself. I mean, how would you feel about me? If, if every week I'm up here and I'm like, you know, I have learned how to be very godly. I have learned how to um, rise above all my problems. I have learned how to be perfectly content. I have learned how to basically not sin as much as you do. You should probably throw me out. It, it sounds a little arrogant. It's funny that Paul says this about himself, but get what he's saying. He's saying, I have learned this, which means it didn't come from me. It didn't come naturally to me. God took a sledgehammer to my soul and banged the discontentment out of me. I have learned this. So I read this not as an arrogant statement of I've learned how to be godly all the time, but as a humble statement that man, oh man, was I a fool. Man, oh man, would I mess everything up if God wasn't constantly
teaching me, working in me, reworking my mind, reworking my heart. So far from bragging, this is an invitation for you, for you to join Paul in this condition. He is not saying, I'm so godly, look at me and weep for yourselves. What he's saying is, I've learned this. And you can learn this too. There's nothing stopping you from learning this except for you. Stop stopping yourself from learning this and learn this and you too can be content in every circumstance. See, it's comforting that he doesn't say, I was born with this. He doesn't say this is a natural ability. He says, this is for you. You can learn this. And that's actually a fact You can learn this right now in this hour if by the Spirit of God he will will open the eyes of your heart to receive what's being preached from his holy living word. That's the second observation from the word learned. The third observation is the word secret. The fact that Paul refers to this as a secret or maybe your translation calls it a mystery. I can do all things, uh, he says, through him who strengthens me in verse 13. In verse 12, the phrase leading into that, he says, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. He calls it a secret. And what is the secret? I can do it all through Christ who strengthens me. The secret is that it's through Christ who strengthens him. Through Christ who strengthens him. That's the link back to 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Christ's grace operative in us. It's Christ who strengthens us. That's the, that's the, the secret here that's being communicated. You see here in Philippians, in Philippians 4, Paul says, I've learned the secret. And the thing about Philippians is it is a very open secret because the secret to contentment is written large and highlighted in the most obnoxious fluorescent highlighter in Philippians chapter 1, in Philippians chapter 2, in Philippians chapter 3, and finally it's exposed here in Philippians chapter 4 that the secret is Christ, and that's the most openly declared secret that there ever has been. So let's just flip backwards a little bit from Philippians 4. This is the open secret. I'll I'll, I'll show it to you in chapter 3, chapter 2, and chapter 1 real quick. Back to Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 14. This is the secret to contentment. It's right here on the page. I'm in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and that I may share his sufferings becoming like him in death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not that I've already obtained this, not that I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider what I have, that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I think maybe the reason Paul calls uh, contentment a secret or a mystery The reason he calls it a secret or a mystery is kind of because of what he says here. The secret, the mystery of contentment that makes you scratch your head is that the contentment of chapter 4 requires the discontent of chapter 3. The contentment of chapter 4 requires this longing discontentment of chapter 3. In order to achieve full contentment, We have to press and press and press on toward Christ relentlessly and hungrily. Contentment with 
your earthly goods shows spiritual strength. Contentment with your earthly goods shows spiritual strength. But contentment with how well you know Christ shows spiritual weakness. Contentment with how well you know Christ shows spiritual weakness. Contentment as it touches physical things and earthly circumstances surely is a virtue. But contentment that says, I know Christ well enough and I don't have to press on toward him is surely a vice. So far from being the opposite of contentment, Philippians chapter 3 is what this contentment rises out of. To know Christ, but to press on to know him more. And as we know him more, we're more willing to suffer like him. And then as we get to suffer like him, 2 Corinthians 12, I suffered the thorn. As we suffer, we know Christ better because Christ came down here to suffer. And it is our suffering that brings us into union with Christ experientially, even as Hebrews 2 and 4 say that it was his suffering that brought him into experiential union with us so that he could be the advocate that we needed. It's found in this suffering. To know Christ, but to press on to know him more. That's why he says in verse 8, everything's lost for the sake of knowing Christ. That's why he says in verse 10, that I may know him. And that's why he says in verses 12 to 14, I haven't obtained it yet, but I press on. One thing I do, I forget what's behind and I press on to know Christ. What he's saying in Philippians 3 is my life is not about my comfort. My life equation is not God plus perfect comfort equals contentment. My life is not about standing still. My desire is to know Christ. It's about knowing Christ. That's what we see in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 2, the most famous chapter in all of Philippians. This great Christ hymn that he didn't regard his own equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, became obedient. He suffered to the point of death, even the most excruciating death possible, even death on a cross. So he, he went from this highly exalted position to down as low as he could be, but the Christ hymn has this double movement in it, and it says, though he let that go, and he came down and suffered. Then it says at the end of the Christ hymn, in order that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, and there's this marvelous glory to it. This, Philippians chapter 2 is the attitudinal fortitude, the inner attitudinal engine that drives contentment. Philippians 2 is the inner attitude that drives contentment. Because if your inner attitude is, the better people treat me, and the more honor I receive from people, the more content I will be. If your inner attitude is the better people treat me and the more honor I receive from people, the more content I will be, you're stuck in the most hopeless rat race ever. But the attitude of Christ, the attitude of Christ is my contentment, my joy is to pour myself out for others. If that's your attitude, what on earth is going to stop you from the satisfaction of contentment every day? If that's your attitude, my joy and contentment is in pouring myself out, broken, so that others can see how beautiful Christ is. This inner conviction, I am a servant. I've known a lot of pastors who have burnt out in ministry. I don't think I've ever known a pastor who burnt out in ministry who really, really had the attitude of Philippians 2 burn deep in his spirit. This is what sustains us. And Jesus knew it. Jesus lived it. So I'm like, you know, down here, down here, we get to be tired, we get to be hungry, we get to hurt. Down here, we get to bear the cross. Oh, but up there, up there, we get the crown. And down here, the river sometimes becomes a stream, sometimes becomes a trickle, sometimes becomes just a little bit of wet sludge. 
I cannot tell you that your family is going to be all that you hope it'll be. I cannot tell you that your church is going to be all that you hope it'll be. I can't promise you a mighty roaring river down here. It might just be a trickle. But I can tell you this. There is a fountain. There is a fountain above. The fountain is Christ. And if you are in Christ, that is a fountain where there is fullness of joy forever. And it's yours because he's, he, you are his. That's the secret in Philippians 2. The secret in Philippians 1 most famous verse in Philippians 1 is where he says, for me to live is Christ, and so for me to die is gain. He says in Philippians 1 verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that whatever happened to me has served for the advance of the gospel. And then he says in Philippians 1 verse 18, he says, uh, Christ is going to be proclaimed and I'm going to rejoice. And he says, I expect to be delivered. But he says in the end of verse 12, Christ, or at the end of verse 20, look at verse 20. Now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. The equation in Philippians 1 is my life is not about my life. My life is about Christ. My life is not about my comforts. My life is about Christ. My life is not about my dreams being fulfilled. My life is about Christ. It's about knowing Christ and making Christ known. So we see the open secret there in Philippians 1, there in Philippians 2, and there in Philippians chapter 3. This is the secret. This is the open secret of contentment, that it's Christ. Let's compare contentment to being warm, and let's compare discontentment to being cold. Because, beloved, I grew up in Southern California. It's 88 degrees there today. We're headed into winter. Uh, this is my home. I raised my family here. I'm not going anywhere. I love Wisconsin. I, I can't say that I love freezing to death, okay? Because that, all my roots are back in Southern Cal. So every winter, I get cold. But I have a gym membership, and my gym has a sauna. And that sauna is like Hades itself. That sauna is so hot. And on the coldest days of winter, I go to my gym, and I go into that sauna, and I just sit in there until I am so hot that I can't take it anymore. The problem is, I tried it. They wouldn't let me live in the sauna from December through March. They were like, you have to leave every night. I mean, how inconvenient is that? I have to go outside again and I get cold again. If contentment is based on circumstances, then that's what it's like. I, I just, I can warm up because my circumstances are okay for these 10 minutes of my little experience but there's no guarantee that it's going to stay that way because I'm going to have to walk out of the sauna. But what if, what if I could have that heat like inside of me so that when I left that circumstance, when I left that location, the heat was still with me. This, this is exactly what Philippians 4, 11 through 13 means. If I have Christ in me, whatever circumstance I'm in, my contentment level is the same because I have Christ in me. True contentment radiates from within by the spirit of Christ having, having victory over my spirit of discontentment. Christian contentment isn't conditioned on outward circumstances. It's a, it, it's a habit of character that is woven through Christ's communion with my soul. That's what this means. That's what this means. How do you become stronger and be changed to be a more content person? Well, question. What causes you to become discontent? What causes you to lose heart? What makes you 
want to give up? What shatters your soul's contentment? Your motivation to stay strong is only as strong as that in which you've placed your hope. Your motivation to stay strong is only as strong as that in which you've placed your hope. Notice I'm not saying your motivation to stay strong is only as strong as you are. I love you. I even esteem you. But you all are weak. I am too. If your motivation to stay content was only as strong as you are, I wouldn't have much hope. But see, your ability and motivation to remain content, it depends on the object in which you have placed your faith. Your faith. Your cultivation of contentment is only as rich as that in which you have placed your hope. Your cultivation of contentment is only as rich as that in which you have placed your hope. And if you've placed your hope in some circumstantial working out all right, then your cultivation is going to be mighty thin, mighty poor. The steadiness of your soul in suffering is only as stable as what you've placed your stability in. The steadiness of your soul in suffering is only as stable as what you've placed your stability in. Have you placed it in Christ? No human being is able to hold your hope. No circumstance is able to carry your hope. Nothing down here is able to carry your hope. Everything down here just becomes a trickle from time to time. But there is a rock that will hold your hope. It is Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, ascended to heaven, yet present in your spirit if you are born again. True contentment is only experienced in union with Christ. Because I am in union with Christ. I don't even blink and hesitate. I say with Paul, I am ready for any and every circumstance because Christ is in me and I am in Christ. It's that union with Christ that is the anchor of my soul. So beloved, the last thing that I'm saying is that by some decision of your will, you can decide to be more content next week than you were last week. What I'm saying is you need Jesus. And the declaration of the gospel is that Jesus knows you need him, so he has come to you willingly. I'm not asking you to buck up and just make the best of your circumstances. I'm asking you to look to Christ because it is only a believing look at Jesus that makes it right. If you're a believer, look to Christ. And if you are here this morning and there are some of you and you're not yet a believer in Christ, I'm just saying in sincerity with no drama to it, you are in a storm and you have no safe harbor. But if you will come to Christ, you can be saved. You can be saved. There's hope in Christ. Come to him. Believe in him. Look to him. Trust in him. And in Christ, you can be safe. Let's pray. Spirit of God, give now to your people a believing glimpse at Jesus. Spirit of God, give now to these women and men gathered here saving faith in our Christ. Lord, our eyes slip so often. We lose the heat of contentment so quickly 
we place our hope in the shifting sands of circumstances, automatically it's part of our human nature, part of our fallenness. And so, Spirit of God, we ask that by your work within us, you would cause us to place our hope in Christ. We no longer live underneath the shifting sands of circumstances, but we would dwell with Christ on high. Oh, let us see Jesus. Let us see all of our treasure and all of our soul's hope there in him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.